good morning to the people in the regions of USA, KSA, uh, Oman, uh, Bahrain, Qatar, and Egypt. Good afternoon to the people in India. Compliance Standing Awards and Symposium is an industry event to recognize outstanding work in the areas of governance, risk, and compliance. It is also a platform for leaders to share their viewpoints on contextual and pertinent topics. This symposium garners the attention of over 60,000 industry professionals. Compliance Standing is a platform that recognizes exemplary performance in compliance. Mr. Deepak Parekh aptly labeled Compliance Standing as the Oscars of Compliance. Over the years, the compliance crusaders like Mr. Adi Godrej, Anuaga, Mr. Narayan Murthy, Mr. Damodaran, Mr. Deepak Pare, and Dr. R. A. Mashadkar, Mr. Harish Sarve, and Mr. Vinu Srinivasan have shared their views to an audience of over 60,000 compliance and risk professionals. As a major part of the compliance center is a compliance week, which is a compliance ethics week, which has various webinars and workshops. As a part of the Compliance Week, we arrange pioneers in the business to guide and enlighten our audiences. As a part of the three webinars that we had, on day one, on the 4th of October, we had Mr. Anjal Raj, who spoke on FSSI and plastic waste. We Yesterday, on the 6th of October, we had Mr. Sunil Dalai from Endurance speak on EHS and other pertinent topics. Today, we have Mr. Gaurav Medirata, Group General Counsel of Landmark Group, which is one of the largest retail and hospitality conglomerates in the Middle East, Africa, and India. Currently, the group operates over 2,200 outlets, encompassing over 30 million square feet across 21 countries. At Landmark Group, Gaurav, Gaurav leads a team of 28 lawyers and paralegals and is responsible for overseeing the legal function, encompassing litigation, advocacy, and compliance. Data privacy, employment, arbitration, environment, IPR protection, contracts, and MA are his uh, strong points. Garo has 22 years of professional experience in the legal and compliance domain, out of which 17 years were spent in the Hindustan Unilever Limited. Prior to joining Landmark, Garo was the chief legal officer of Marico, based out of Mumbai. Garo is an honors graduate in commerce and has done his LLB from Delhi University. He also holds a diploma in cyber law for the Indian uh, Law Institute. Thank you, Doro, for making the time and uh, finding it a very analytical session, which is uh, come in the in the one hour that we have. Uh, thank you so much for making the time once again, and we hand it over to you for walking us through this pertinent topic. Hello, Doro. No, I'll just, it says the host is unmuted. So. Can you hear me now, Jadeep? Yes, Gaurav, we can hear you loud and, and clear. You Thank you. Me as well. And now just confirm if the slides are visible. You. The slides are visible. Yes, now they are visible they are in the slide share. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much, uh, Jadeep, for those words. It's always a pleasure to speak uh, for Legasis in any event. I and Legasis go a long way back. Uh, you guys helped me implement the entire compliance framework for my previous organization. And when I came into Landmark, I realized that uh, you are also partners with us here and we immediately got cracking. And of course, uh, I and Mr. Suhas Tulzapurkar happen to be the alma maters of a very prestigious institution, I call it, not a company. Uh, and that's how I think it's a very, very special relationship that I have with Legasis. And when they approach me, I never say no. Um, today, what we'll do is we'll talk about uh, the whole compliance framework that we have set up for our organization uh, in the Middle East. It's a journey which has begun. It's a very, very large group, and I will just talk about it in a few minutes. But it's important that uh, we understand that given the complexity of the group, uh, we have possibly started and we are 30 to 40% there. 
we still have a very very long way to go so allow me to uh, present to you what we have uh, on the compliance uh, side for the landmark group so this is what i propose to cover in the next 30 to 35 minutes and i'll leave enough time for question and answers i have two of my colleagues also on the call ashish and spardha uh, who take care of compliance so ashish heads the compliance and spardha uh, is a uh, supports him and is the compliance manager for us uh, in the group and uh, they'll be certainly there if there are any questions that i need their support on i know they're there to jump in um this is what i'll cover i'll first talk a little bit about the group i have alluded to the complexity of the group and you will hear it from me once i come to slide 1 we'll talk about uh, our compliance program and what all it covers today and a framework which i believe is a gold standard framework if an organization is doing these three or four things right four things to be precise it cannot go wrong um then what i have decided is that i'll talk about three countries uh in some detail uh, just to highlight what are the kind of challenges what are the kind of compliances that are required and uh, you know with the evolving laws how these territories are looking at uh, you know compliance and 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 sort of yeah and then finally some steps and more guidance really of what a successful compliance program looks like and finally a compliance dashboard in terms of how it gets reported to the management team so the first one i think jaydeep did talk about it a little bit but let me just take a little more time on this one this is the footprint of the landmark retail and hospitality we are in 21 countries uh, 2200 stores 30 million square feet of space if i have to just you know give you some analogy it would be about 2500 olympic size swimming pools which this space covers um 43 brands 26 our own brands and i'll talk about it in the next slide and then we also have very strong franchise relationships with multinational organizations based out of uh, europe based out of america and we'll talk about a little bit about those brands also uh, as we said we are in 21 countries and the map on the right hand side suggests so egypt the whole of gcc here uh a little bit of africa uh the southeast asia which is predominantly malaysia and indonesia is where we have presence india i must hasten to add is a separate profit center um it's a separate business uh, which is run by the promoters uh, and has a separate leadership team so india does not come within the purview of this team uh, we take care of all of the rest of the world except india so in terms of workforce we are 48000 strong uh, shopping runs in the blood in the middle east and we are right there to support the customers here uh, both on the retail and hospitality side we have 70 plus nationalities in our business 34% of whom are women in case i'll talk about the feminization program and the saudiization program that they are running there the governments are running and 72% of our staff because we are so strong on retail uh, most of the staff on the retail floors uh, are women and 72% of our staff are saudi nationals um, are women now these are the brands now for those of you in india maybe lifestyle home center uh, rings a bell but uh, the large and max of course max is the largest uh, a concept that we have which is value retail value apparels uh, center point is a is a combination of four brands which is baby shop splash shumart and lifestyle it is all sold under one umbrella in large parts of gcc again it's split between apparels uh, baby uh, related baby stuff uh, apparels again for splash and we have a very strong shoe business in the middle east which we run under shumart uh there's also shoe express which is the value shoes but uh, currently shoe mart is really the focus and then there is lifestyle in india lifestyle is about apparels here lifestyle is indeed as the word suggests lifestyle itself which is a little bit of home uh, accessories and so on and so forth max as i said is our largest concept uh, contributing to a few billion um home center and home box 
are again very very large businesses um, taking care of entire home accessories home furniture and so on emacs uh, for, for those of you in india is on the lines of a chroma or a vijay sales and it's an electronic store where you get everything electronic i'll talk about viva and styly separately oasis is a very unique concept so while in all other places we rent out stores from major developers or we have stand alone stores oasis is a concept where we lease out the entire mall from the landlords and then we sublease it to about 40 50 or 100 tenants depending on the size of the store and we have several oasis malls also in the region shukran is a loyalty program it is the largest loyalty program in the region we have 10 million plus customers so anybody who buys any landmark product gets points which can be redeemed when you are coming for future shopping so it is the largest and that's where the largest customer information gets collected and that's where data privacy comes into the picture i move on and then i come to that so the earlier slide was the footprint of landmark retail this is landmark hospitality it's about 15% of the group uh the the big one here is the city max hotels we have about six hotels which are between 3 to 4 star again landmark is all about value for the customers and and therefore you see we are not playing in five star hotel properties these are three and four star hotels we have about six of them in the region we have uh, the franchise of fran fitness first we have the entire kids entertainment there that you see fun city fun ville fun works fun block trident Uh, parts of it is also there sit fun city fun don mistaken is also there in india but these are the different concepts that we run in the middle east then we have restaurants we have franchises of various restaurants like carluccio's which is an italian restaurant max zafran nando's we have franchises so that's the footprint of hospitality and this gives you some sense of what kind of compliance i am talking about in the subsequent slides because our goal is to really make the whole organization fit into the compliance framework that we have as i as i said we have begun the journey but given the fact that we have retail then we have hospitality we have we are dealing with foods and we are also dealing with e-commerce styly is a new concept that we have started uh, pandemic taught us that the growth of e-commerce in the middle east is absolutely unprecedented 2019 we launched styly in saudi and it's doing extremely well there currently styly is present in four countries again when we talk e-commerce we talk e-commerce compliances and laws and i will talk about uh, the challenges that we face uh, you know uh, when we are talking local e-commerce in saudi versus cross border e-commerce which is taking place in saudi in the subsequent slides this is i think one of the most exciting businesses for us again it's in the nascent stage uh, these are large format supermarkets everything to do with uh, that you know in a regular supermarket would be here we but this is a private label uh, we don't sell regular brands here it's pure private label um, and we we source this from various countries including several countries in the europe people who have are familiar with the aldis and the littles of europe which are all uh, value discounters are are then familiar that what viva does it's it's almost uh, inspired from that con that concept in europe and we have now opened about 65 stores and we are very gradually but surely uh, touching about to touch 1 million square feet in retail space exciting business there are big plans to expand it beyond uh, beyond dubai which is currently uae where it is right now we have 65 stores we certainly want to take it beyond dubai and and in the next couple of years uh, we aim to maybe touch about 200 stores here so lots and lots of work here lots of compliance because there it's directly customer facing we are talking fmcg products we are talking you know uh, product compliances we are talking store compliances and so on and so forth so this is really the uh, overview of our entire compliance program that we are running currently uh, we have all of these uh, on the top are the number of entities that we are dealing with uh, the number of stores uh, you see only a number of 925 because this is what we are now touching Uh, we have of course uh, a lot more to go um, number of functions 
our finance, health, safety, regulatory, human resources, public relations, uh, licenses, compliance, warehouse compliance, secretarial, and so on. We have federal and local laws, which have all acts and rules uh, in the territory. Uh, we have, of course, uh, lots and lots of users, a thousand plus users, only for these five countries that we are talking about. And then those unique compliances, which I mentioned in the last, for these five territories. Before I get into what are the compliance requirements for each of the territories, for me, this is the compass that we religiously follow. The first thing to get compliance right is to know what is the compliance and make it absolutely comprehensive. And the lessons of my previous job have taught me that unless I know exactly what are the number of compliances and I get the number of users right, I will never be able to succeed. So it's absolutely imperative that when we talk of a territory, we know exactly what are the numbers of those compliances. We also know that as and when the changes are taking place, our partners, Legatrix, Legasis, are making sure that we are updating ourselves so that we are always current and we don't have dated compliances that we are tracking. The number two challenge that I always faced uh, was that the number of users, again, is a very dynamic number. We are talking stores here and the stores have the highest attrition. People jump jobs for 100 dirhams also. Right, And therefore, it's important that we are able to track the, the, the user's list very, very carefully, and we keep updating that. The second is people need to know. These are not legal people, they, but the, the operating people need to know what are the jobs to be done and how these compliances have to be met. It may be a thankless job, but it has to be done nevertheless because the consequences are very severe. The third for me is the heart and soul, because this is where the maker's job is over and the checker's job begins. And we have a, a team which takes care of, the, of checking these compliances at the back end. And for me, it is not just about checking in the system. It's about physical checking in the stores. It's absolutely important that we are not only checking the system for compliances, but we also take visits to the stores and last year, Saudi, which is our biggest business, 50% of our uh, volumes get sold out of Saudi. We have ensured that we have done almost 75% of the stores have been checked physically by us to ensure that what we are reporting is actually in sync with what is there on the ground. And finally, building a compliance culture. What do I mean by that? I think the tone has to always come from the top. We make sure that the heads of the territory, the heads of the businesses are responsible. And the communication not just goes from the legal head or the compliance head, but it goes from the guys who are operating or who are operationally in charge of those territories. Two, we must make sure that there is a proper reward and recognition mechanism in place. There is nothing uh, that motivates people than getting recognized in life. And this is another way of doing it. I said, alluded to it, it can be seen as a thankless job. And therefore, how do you make sure that you have a robust compliance culture starting from tone from the top, making sure that you're managing and reviewing everything. And finally, people who are good at it must get recognized. So this is the framework that we follow religiously as we go into each territory. And now we have gone into four and we are going to start the fifth one also shortly. Now, Quickly, I'll talk about the three territories that I thought are important. And a lot of action is taking place there um, as we speak. The first one and the most important for us is Saudi Arabia. As I said earlier, 50% of our business comes from there. And there is lots and lots of action taking place. Before I get into the actual compliances, we must know and we must have heard of the Saudi vision of 2030, uh, which MBS, Mohammed bin Sal uh, Salman, uh, who's the crown prince and now the prime minister of KSA, uh, has uh, articulated for his country. And the plan is simple. The, the kingdom wants to reduce the dependence on oil and make sure that they diversify into different sectors, uh, whether it's health, education, infrastructure, tourism, and make sure that they are increasing the economic, economic and investment activities uh, in, in the region. So there is a lot happening and the economy is opening up as we speak. And I, of course, I've only visited Saudi once in the last one year, 
But I hear stories from people who have come back and said that they see a completely different uh, place uh, where the ways of working are changing, where uh, there's so much development taking place. And of course, the country wants to make sure that the Saudis also, uh, one way, a sure shot way for a country to progress is to ensure that its people are also progressing and they are not just relying on expats. And that comes and brings me to Saudiization. Uh, that is uh, something which is absolutely hot right now in Saudi. Uh, we are expected to hire Saudi nationals on a quota basis. Uh, there was a decision uh, on total Saudiization in the malls, which, which, was, which got taken uh, in, on the 4th of August 2021, which means that all the jobs in a particular store in a mall are expected to be done by Saudis. Of course, there are ex exceptions to that. It excludes professions like cleaning work, loading, unloading, maintenance, barber shops, and so on and so forth, which are uh, reserved for non-Saudis. But anybody in the front of the store uh, is expected to be a Saudi. Now, the government believes that by doing this, they'll be able to generate about 51,000 jobs for Saudis, upskill them, and train them uh, to bring them within the, the, the mainstream of economic activities in the country. And that's how this concept of quota is called nitakat in Saudi. And for each category of job in the country, there is a nitakat percentage which is determined, which the countries are, the, the corporates are expected to follow. So we know for a fact that in every single function, whether it's finance, legal, supply chain, IT, marketing, sales, there is a certain percentage of Saudis which are expected to be hired. Now, there can be violations in this as well. You could be hiring non-Saudis in jobs which are specifically reserved for Saudis. Or you're not meeting the nitakat percentage of Saudis that you're expected to hire. Each of these entails fines. And companies have been suffering because of this, because of not being able to follow the right nitakat percentage. The second one is feminization. So just like they're reserving jobs for Saudis, they're also wanting to make sure that it leads to upliftment of women in the, in the, in the territory. And therefore, there's an expectation that there would be uh, special jobs which are completely reserved uh, for the ladies, Saudi ladies. Now, these could be uh, you know, women's apparels, perfumes, abayas, shoes, clothes. Anything to do with women is now reserved for women uh, to, to ensure that there is higher employment there. Again, this is an initiative which is run by uh, the, the wife of the crown prince. And this is something which uh, is top of the mind, uh, even for all of us uh, in the retail industry when it comes to hiring. They hope to generate about 80,000 jobs uh, for women by next year, uh, just by you know, by the feminization program that they have, and they aim to have about half a million by 2030. The other one is data protection. Now, let me talk a little bit about this also, because this is, and again, a, an extremely, extremely important area where there are rapid developments taking place in Saudi. On 24th September 21, they came out with a new data protection law pretty much on the lines of GDPR. And the enforcement of it has been deferred to March 23. Now, the authority which leads this data protection for, for the Saudi is called Saudi Data and Artificial Intelligence Authority. It's called Sadaya. And one look at the website of Sadaya tells you the importance that data privacy is going to have or data protection is going to have in the middle in, 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 in Saudi. The entire board of Sadaya comprises of the entire cabinet of the company, country. You have the, the, the crown prince and his top ministers as part of Sadaya, uh, chairing Sadaya and being important and prominent members. Uh, there are two areas which concern us as corporates. One is cross-border consent. Sorry, uh, one is the consent. And the second is cross-border transfer. And both of these, given the size and scale of the businesses, the expectation is, if the expectation is that there has to be an explicit consent taken from customers uh, before their data is used, processed, or even transferred, 
that means we are talking about 6 million consents to be taken by the time this law comes into force. So that's an area of concern. We are working very, very closely um, uh, with some agencies there to figure out what should be the response and how do we approach the government uh, to get some relaxation in, in, in these consents. And of course, we have started the journey of obtaining these consents, but to reach that number is an almost impossibility is all I can say at this stage. And the other, of course, is very important, which is cross-border transfer of data. Today, all the corporates, we can say with fair, fair degree of confidence, would have their data centers located outside of Saudi Arabia. The processing of this data is taking place in Europe, Ireland, in, in Bangalore, and various other places for almost all the corporates. Uh, if there is a prohibition on a cross-border consent, uh, cross-border transfer, uh, what is it that the companies need to do now? to ensure that approvals are sought and what kind of data you can take outside the territory is another body of work uh, from a compliance standpoint, which has begun. And then the regular stuff, which is the licenses. You have civil defense, you have Baladia, which is a municipality equivalent, commercial registration of, of the store, the VAT registration. All of these are things that we have to ensure when we talk of compliance in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, it's a very important uh, country for any business in Middle East. I think Saudi is by, by far the biggest and the most important business. And therefore, we make sure that it's, it's the disproportionate focus uh, remains on Saudi. I will then come to UAE. And again, UAE is where the head office is located for us. And it becomes extremely important that we are doing it absolutely right here as well. The first one, the changes that are taking place uh, in UAE from the perspective of companies law. Again, we have a new companies law which has come in and on the 2nd of January 2022. The first big change that we noticed was, you know, it strengthens the principles of foreign ownership of companies. Earlier, you had to have a 51% shareholder, which was a UAE national. UAE has relaxed that. For about 1,000 jobs in Dubai, 1,000 different, sorry, sectors or activities in Dubai, and about 1,100 in Abu Dhabi, they have made this relaxation. And those companies no longer need a 51% partner who has to be an Emirati. That's a big one. There are new corporate governance standards which have come in for LLC companies. And there are provisions for minority protection. Uh, the second one is the big one that we encountered was on 2nd of February last year, sorry, this year, we have a new labor law, a new labor code which has come in. And again, the first big change that we noticed was that we used to have unlimited term contracts that has all gone shifted into a limited term contract, which is about three years for each employee. There are different flexible working models which have been articulated uh, given the pandemic and the lessons that the pandemic has taught. I think each company has today evolved different and flexible working models, whether it's full-time, part-time, temporary, seasonal, all those working models have been now articulated in uh, the, the new labor law. There are provisions of both termination of employers and termination by uh, employees. Uh, during the probationary period. Uh, there is a new article 44, which talks about circumstances under which termination can happen for a cause. If there is a material breach in the employment contract about this, or the code of conducts of the companies, there is a way in which terminations have to be done. And of course, gratuity is something that unless and until there is an order of the court, you cannot touch. That is something that has to be paid unless uh, the, the violation is such uh, that the court itself believes that the gratuity has to be forfeited. Uh, there are new rules around maternity pay. Uh, earlier, it was 45 days. Now it has been uh, up to about 60 days. There's parental leave of five days, which is available. Uh, there's a non-compete uh, that the companies can sign with their employees uh, for about two years. Having said so, that in practice, in reality, to enforce something like this is a Herculean task. But yes, it can always act as a deterrent. Then other unique aspect of 
UAE is the free zones. And if I just talk GCC in general, uh, you know, there are about 55 free zones in the UAE. There are four in Oman, three in Bahrain, one in Kuwait, and KSA calls it special economic zones. And these are basically uh, zones called out within the, the territories where the goods can be placed free of any customs duties uh, for either display or sale. Now, it's easier said than done because audits, compliances, documentation for every single product entering into the free zone has still to be maintained because there can be periodic audits that can be done. And each of these free zones, especially free zones like Javza, uh, et cetera, uh, have their own labor rules, employment rules, uh, commercial laws, corporate laws. So all of those are very, very specific uh, to some of these. And we need to, as lawyers, continuously go through these and make sure that from a compliance standpoint, uh, we are taking care of these as well. Emiratization, just like Saudiization, uh, emiratization is equally critical. Uh, January 23 is when they expect 2% of the private companies, any private company's workforce must be moved into, uh, by, must be Emiratis. If that company is employing more than 50 people. For banks and insurance companies, the number is actually higher. It's 4% and 5% respectively. Uh, and they intend to take it. Uh, from the discussions that we see, they intend to take the emiratization number to about 10% uh, by 2026. And of course, uh, needless to say, all of these come with penalties if they are not followed in letter and spirit. The other change that is taking place here is the corporate income tax. That's a huge one. And every day we are seeing articles in newspapers and how companies are gearing up for it. This is the first time a corporate income tax is getting levied. It's still much lower than the rest of the world. It's at 9% of federal corporate income tax on the business profits. And the threshold is about 375,000 dirhams. The enforcement of it begins from 1st of June, 2023. While the team here is not entirely or directly responsible for corporate income tax, but there are lots and lots of areas as we restructure uh, which also come within the legal and the secretarial team's fold. Therefore, there are compliances regarding those uh, that, that we are trying to meet here. So that's really a quick snapshot of what's happening in UAE. I then moved to Bahrain. And Bahrain, uh, while it's a much smaller country, I think within 30 kilometers or 40 kilometers, you can cover the whole of Bahrain. The population is about 15 lakhs, 1.5 million, out of which... 50% or 60% would be, actually 70% would be the South Asian nationalities and about 30% would be Bahrainis. But the, the nationalization policies have started happening everywhere. We have seen Saudiization, we have seen Emiratization, we are seeing Omanization, and therefore Bahrainization is also not very far away. There are quotas to appoint Bahrainis uh, in every single job. And employers who don't comply with Bahrainization would be expected to pay, if I have to just convert it into INR, it would be about 70,000 per new employee for visa application if case we are hiring an expat in place of an, a Bahrain. So that's something that, that is uh, what we need to be uh, you know, very conscious of. The other one is the whole corporate governance code. Now, this is a new code which has come in. And uh, it has some very fundamental principles which are expected to be followed again. Best practices, best ways to manage uh, and lead businesses in transparent and clearly defined policies, processes, and procedures. Uh, you know, I have a whole list of those 11 principles. I'll not read through all of them, but it will just give you, a, you know, a broad compass or a guidance in, in terms of what what are the various tenets of it and how then the compliances get structured. It says the company will be headed by an effective qualified expert board. There have to be proper and effective procedures for appointment, training, evaluation of the board. Remunerations of the directors and officers have to be determined fairly. Boards shall have a properly approved management structure for the companies, properly defined job titles, powers, etc. Company communicates with shareholders, encourage them to participate and respect their rights, uh, disclose their corporate governance, 
and it also touches upon the integrity of the financial statements which are submitted to the shareholders through the use of external auditors talks about social responsibility uh, and so on so we are working and we have devised our own corporate governance codes uh, for bahrain to make sure that we are meeting all these 11 guiding principles and then the compliances that are there uh, within those uh data protection is not far away again uh, every single territory every single country in gcc has a data protection law today in some shape or form the enforcement of it at least i'm happy to report right now is not as rigorous but as we go territory by territory we know for a fact that saudi and uae would have a properly laid out law by next year and the other countries are going to not going to be very far away and therefore issues like cross border transfer of data especially when data centers are located outside and express written consents become extremely important for corporations to deal with i now move to my last two slides and this is just about making sure and 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 you know talking to the participants here the audience here on what is it that we do to make sure that we have a proper system in place there have to be proper written policies and procedures you have to have a compliance officer ideally a compliance committee conducting effective and continuous training this is the heart and soul because people who are doing this are store employees are store managers whose day job is to ensure that you are taking in inventory and making sure that you are selling it out this is possibly not a priority item and therefore how do you make it exciting to ensure that this effective training and and education results in them making sure that they are compliant conducting internal monitoring and auditing like comprehensive I'm sorry compliance inspections i said for me uh, the guy who is the maker there have to be checkers also compliance is best done when there is a maker and there is a checker and i do not just believe in checking it in my ivory chamber here looking at a portal and saying yes they have done it i like to make sure that we are going to the ground visiting each store and also validating what is getting reported is actually there uh, pasted in a conspicuous part of the store establish a two way communication at all levels between the maker and the checker we are not inspectors or auditors we are in it together and the goal is the same which is to reach 100% compliance and once you detect a problem uh, do not first fix responsibility first fix the problem and then figure out uh, what went wrong and then do the post mortem those are the simple principles that we follow this is just a simple dashboard this does not uh, it's just a pictorial representation it's not my company's numbers here but this is the dashboard that i get to see every month when i review compliance for each territory it tells me which territory is fully compliant where there is late reporting happening and what is not complied that dashboard then all i have to look at is the non complied and look at what are the specific ones and what is the causal factor which is leading to those delays once we have identified those all that is required is to write an email with facts to the relevant head of that team now whether it is employment so therefore hr or it is admin and therefore the pro those people would typically get an email from the compliance head saying that this is what we have picked up this is where we are not going right and this is the help and support that we require and if you do that right day after day week after week and month after month there is absolutely no way that you can reach a near 100% i always say it's impossible to attain 100% compliance for just the sheer numbers that we deal with but we need to reach as close to that as possible yeah so with that i end my talk shukran thank you so much for listening in and i am very happy now to take any questions i have my colleagues on the call if i am not able to answer i am sure they'll step in over to you jaydeep
जयदीप कैन यू हेयर मी Thanks, Gaurav, for the session. If there are any questions from the audience, uh, yes, I have one question from Mr. Matthew. Uh, how one entity will comply with different data protection laws in all of the GCC countries is what his question is. You see, uh, there is no easy answer to this. What we do is that. you go territory by territory you need to of course first understand the requirement and the law in each territory you need to then make sure that each of the functions there are there are customer data which would be setting so you need to do the inventorization first of the data which is sitting with sales supply chain whichever is the customer facing function you need to understand what is the size and scale of the problem then there are four or five things in terms of ensuring the rights of the data subject there are five or six things that need to be done right and that is a principle which is common across that you need to get right you need to have a data protection officer dpo for each territory you need to make sure that your contracts are data data privacy compliant that means there are data protection clauses in that and you have also back to back similar arrangements with the data processors because a lot of this data goes to the ibms and the accentures and the various other consultants that we have and to make sure that we have back to back arrangements with them as well where uh, you have these data processing agreements with them to fasten the liability and make sure that in case the the regulations change uh, we have the ability to exit those contracts right the third element of this is consent and the companies need to make sure that in the best possible way you are able to get an express consent where you are not able to get an express consent is there an opportunity to do advocacy with that territory or with that country to ensure that implied consent will be treated as as sacrosanct at least for the customers who you already have and you don't have to go retrospectively so matthew the challenge that we face is exactly this we have to first inventorize we need to know what is the size and scale of the problem we need to get a dpo in or somebody who understands data privacy who is able to implement it in the organization get all the contracts right which means in introduce the data protection clause because when the regulator will call you the first thing you need to demonstrate is that as a prudent data principle you are able to uh, uh, data owner sorry data controller you are able to put in the right systems in the pl in place and then if there are violations we know for a fact that there is leniency also for organizations which have demonstrated enough and more steps as i said earlier it's impossible to say that we'll be data privacy compliant on march 23 when the law comes into force but we need to constantly touch be in touch with the government to know what are the chinks in our armor and seek dispensation wherever it is so yes the answer is you have to go country by country you then have to call out specific uh, common principles these six things that i just talked about and then attack each country and make sure that you are having it in place it's not simple at all it's one of the most challenging uh, projects that we will undertake uh, in the one next one year i can tell you I hope it answers your question Thanks, at least 50%, Matthew. I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. Indeed, he says. Thanks, thank you, Arav. I have one more question uh, from Abhika. Uh, has any AML law impacted Landmark, and if there is any governance on the same anti-money laundering? See, not uh, not in my experience, very honestly, and I'm happy to have Ashish. jump in if he wants to uh, he's the he's the company secretary here he's also the head of compliance for us uh, but not in my experience uh, um, that we have seen any money laundering allegations 
come come for us so yeah that's typically that what i can do ambika i may not have a straight answer to this question but we can look at what are the specific compliances from an anti money laundering law perspective and we can certainly share that with you right and that just gives us uh, some perspective of uh, how it has to be done or dealt with ashish you want to add anything please feel free otherwise we can move to the next question so ashish you might have to uh, uh, hold up your hand because there are few ashish that i see and i will uh, you know kind of elevate you as a panelist so you will be able to speak yes i will do that so ashish i believe you are now a panelist so there was one question uh, from one participant i had received earlier and unfortunately he or she could not make it to the session gaurav the uh, gaurav you can uh, stop sharing your screen perhaps the q and a uh, thing is yes yeah, yeah. sorry sorry no problem so uh, one question that we had was uh, there are two questions from the audience actually i have received first was uh, in terms of multilingual things that you get it might be from the governance aspect it will be from the tracking aspect of what uh, policies that you have to frame and how do you impart a universal kind of a scenario across your different countries because uh, locally uh, the different languages the laws which are uh, administered in different languages is a administrative challenge for the central group of people that you have with you so how is it that uh, landmark group as a whole has been able to uh, deal yeah. with that and what are the good practices that you sure. no so we are a diverse team while 70 80% of the team is comprising of indians we have uh, egyptians on the team we have uh, a lebanese national uh we are looking to hire uh, into bahrain as well uh so we have ensured that there is knowledge of arabic language within the team we have one arabic lawyer and an arabic paralegal as well within the team and they are the first port of call for us so any judgment that we receive and judgments here are all received in arabic uh the entire uh, pleadings get translated into arabic while of course we get the benefit of reading it in english but it eventually gets uh, translated into arabic and then get filed our first port of call are the two arab lawyers in our team who make sure that at least they give us the headlines of what we have received if it's a very large judgment or or something that we need further clarity on and we want to go dig deep we have external people available uh, agencies and individuals available who can also uh translate and share with us the fine print of it so that's how we typically manage it but yes you need bilingual lawyers you need bilingual paralegals within the team as well uh to make sure that you are on top of what's happening here thanks thanks ashish uh the second question that i had before the panel started uh, was that uh, there might be instances and uh, that is for validation only is are there instances in which one jurisdiction says on the same point the other jurisdiction says a why so there is a conflict or there is a difference the of how the policy so the question is so uh, for example if bahrain says for a certain point you do x and qatar says for that same point you do a y uh, so there are different uh, policies that you have to uh, state for different uh, jurisdictions have you faced that kind of a situation anywhere and if yeah, yes so how do you deal with it yeah no no so you see each each country has to be treated differently because they are different countries now arabic as a language may run as a common theme between those countries but the re the reality is that there are different kingdoms there are different sultanates which are running those countries and they have their own unique laws so the way we manage it is that we have of course our designated law firms in each territory the compliance program helps us to evaluate what are the specific nuances in each 
territory as far as the law is concerned now the quota system for saudi aisation could be very different from a quota system in bahrain bahrain for example has a concept called tamkeen where if you have hired a bahraini national depending on what job she or he is going into you also get a 30% or a 50% or a 75% reimbursement of their salary from the government now that may not be the case in some other territory so it is horses for courses you need to know the law of each territory i haven't seen too many overlaps happening you have a territory you have a law a legal system for that territory and you follow that whatever you can get to know yourself great whatever you need to arm yourself with from an external law firm make sure that you have credible law firms there who can quickly share with you uh, the changes that are taking place uh, not just in arabic but in your own language uh, so you understand it quickly and get it implemented thanks thanks you so uh, any more questions uh, from the audience going in one going in two going in three so thanks gaurav for this uh, you know kind of enlightening session with uh, all the analysis of it uh, i believe the highlights were that uh, when you mentioned the four things that you have to get it right for any kind of compliance program to be a success uh, users you have to get it you have to ensure that you have the rigor in the uh in the space where you change and upgrade your users upscale your users at a, a certain uh, kind of periodic uh, periodic timeline a clarity to the users clarity to the people who are performing the things at ground is one of the most important things that you mentioned visits to the stores and spot uh, spot physical checks is what struck us uh, is one of the good points that you mentioned uh, most of the uh, compliance uh people overall are only uh you know as as you said correctly are in their ivory chambers and they are uh taking a perspective of this this has to change in some uh, period the compliance culture as you correctly said tone from the top the communication from the operational personnel not only the secretarial or the legal personnel is also very important rewards and recognize cannot be undermined in any uh, scenario uh, two levels of communication and responding promptly for corrective actions rather than only setting people out for failure are the other highlights that i take from this session uh, we thank you once more for such an enlightening analytical and succinct session uh, thank you uh, uh, sparda and ashish for uh, supporting us in this regard and a big thank you and a call out to gaurav for a very very delivered session thank you so much thank you thank you i will we will revert to ambika i am conscious that i my my myself not very pleased with the answer uh, we will revert to ambika on the anti yes. money laundering compliances yes. ashish i think yes. say something so uh, gorov if if uh, you can can everyone hear me yes, yes i can hear you i can hear you uh, okay so just to answer ambika's question see we are a, a we are a retail organization and a retail organization we have a lot of cash transactions and uh, uh, as there are a lot of ca cash transactions there is always a risk of uh, anti money laundering uh, are we have set up the processes that every day whatever the stores are collecting uh, cash has to be deposited under cds machines so that our cash whatever the sales going on per day is deposited and we are able to control on the anti money laundering thing as such retail sector in middle east doesn't have uh, much compliances related to uh, uh, to uh, aml but uh, we are in very much in control of the regulations that there uh, there is a requirements that this has to be done so that we are not on a, a non compliance side of aml that's it thanks thanks ashish thanks for your insights thanks so thank you for a lovely session once more and uh, we look forward to you on the symposium in mumbai physically also thank you so much gaurav thank you sparda thank you ashish thanks bye